Hello my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. I hope you guys are doing great. Can you feel it? Can you feel how close we are getting to perhaps disclosure? Well, you know, this this won't go away and this is ua mua mua. And so if you guys don't remember, this is a quote unquote rock um, that's curiously cylindrical in shape that came into the inner, uh, inner reaches of our solar system wrapped itself around the sun utilizing the sun's gravitational pull and basically sending it back out into deep space uh, admittedly this was something that didn't come from around here according to the scientists and that was like the first interstellar object that we were going to have visibly uh, make note of and that would come into our area and then go out and it just won't this story won't die um, because they keep adding a little bit more to it all the time and so this is really very very curious and as it says here now this is out of Russia today I have just I have two other ones here out of physics.org phys.org and also out of the Daily Mail and there's about 15 at least stories all of talking about the same thing so this is well reported and you have to think about where this ultimately comes from, uh, the story as we're going to look. Interstellar mystery rock Oumuamua might have been part of an alien re reconnaissance mission, according to two Harvard Smithsonian astronomers. Harvard Smithsonian astronomers. Okay, so we make note of that because obviously the Smithsonian's all about cover-ups. You know, Harvard and Yale, and there's there's other ones as well. You know, a lot of those, um, a lot of the top Illuminati come out of those schools as well. So, in other words, you know, this is part of disclosure. This is part of what they want to uh, get across to us at this point in time. So again, they are saying. It could be a light-driven probe. So as the strange rock moved out of our solar system last September, it sped up instead of slowing down, as would be expected. Observers dismissed the acceleration as the result of a release of gas from within the rock. But astronomers Shmuel Bialy and Abraham Loeb are rethinking the whole matter, reasoning that if Oumuamua had been merely a comet undergoing outgassing, the release would have set the object to spinning. Instead, it remained flat. And the astronomers believe that could be by design. And now, you know, as I read that, I'm thinking, well, I remembered when we first saw it, I thought they were saying that this was tumbling and that this was a, a cylindrical shape, which would be the obvious shape you would want to have for a, a long interstellar probe, a long interstellar motherships, uh, uh, something along those lines. And coincidentally, when we, when we hear people talk about the ships of the Draco, and I'm going to, there's so much I could talk about on these topics, and, and if, if you follow the channel, you know, um, I, this is not like the main topic, but I, I, as far as like how much I've researched it and gone into it, um, it's, it's one of my main interests. And so, you know, the Draco, they're, they're everywhere in our culture. They're everywhere on our planet as far as the leftover evidence of them, as we can see over here. Clearly, they are what we envision as demonic. Clearly, when we think of a demon, uh, or even like you know a vampire, think in terms of um, oh gosh, what was the name of that movie with Kate Beckinsale in it? There was a whole series of them. Well, this I think it was the second movie in the series, Underworld. Uh, there's a really good example of a Draco in that one, and so we could see these beings these reptilian beings you know which anyway the Draco ships are supposed to be that shape cylindrical and so you know it makes you really wonder about this as well because you know I mean I feel 
in, in reality, I feel like these things are real, and, and that is my preference. I like to let you, uh, you guys make up your own uh, decision on things. Everybody should make up their own decision. It's just a matter of, of looking at evidence and, and going and deciding for yourself and weighing things for yourself. And so now they're coming out with this, that Uamuamua <laughs> could be powered by a force exerted on its surface by sunlight, Bialy and Loeb concluded. Such a means of power would allow, say, an alien probe to travel farther into the universe with nothing but light needed to fuel it. While there's a possibility that the object is merely an abnormally thin, extremely large, natural occurring piece of interstellar rock, I doubt it, it, doesn't, it, it didn't emit any radio signals detectable by human instruments. They speculate it could be a defunct light sail. Space detritus fallen from a long gone ship. Bialy and Loeb are serious about the possibility Uamuamua may have been deliberately constructed by extraterrestrials. Loeb calculated that for it to be a random object following a random orbit, there would have to be a hundred million more times more of its type hanging around the solar system. Their calculations also indicate that it's the perfect thickness to withstand collisions with space dust, gas, and planetary forces without adding so much mass as to render it incapable of sailing. And it looks and acts a lot like the Starshot Initiative and the Icarus Project, both of which humans built to do pretty much the same thing that astronomers think Uamuamua was doing. So they're leaking this out that this is basically probably an interstellar ship. And um, this was quite large, and it's quite mysterious, or is it? You know, and so the thing that's seriously interesting is the fact that this is coming from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysicists. You know, seriously, this is coming from them? Wow, you know, because they, they've spent their entire life, you know, the Smithsonian, its, its entire existence has been all about keeping us in the dark. So many people right now are saying, well, yeah, that's what they're doing too, because in reality, the world is flat and there are no aliens, and it's just us in this entire everything. We are the only ones in this existence, and there's a, uh, a nice white man with long flowing beard and, and long hair that lives in the cloud and oversees everything, and he has you know, angels that, you know, do all the, the work for us and our work for him and stuff. And, you know, this is all fake. There is not, there's not myriads of different types of life out there. There's not even, you know, other planets out there. There's just us and this guy in the cloud. Um, which obviously, you know, the more we get into all this, and here you're looking at uh, the Icarus space probe with solar sail in flight, and we've seen these, these type of things uh, depicted in, um, I think it was in Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey and other you know sci-fi movies that this is exactly what they would try to utilize in order to, to travel interstellarly. So I think it's pretty obvious, especially when we start looking at all the cultures around the world, all the cultures around the world, all the legends around the world. You know, you have all these different tribes that, you know, just say, hey, our ancestors come from out there. Look at the doggone tribe. And so, you know, there's, there's evidence everywhere. Every single culture, all around the world, all say the same thing. You know, our ancestors came from the stars. So, you know, reality is much more like Star Trek and Star Wars than it is, you know, some of the stories that we have been given. And you could see, guys, you know, it's, that's, there, it's not just the Dogen. It's all the cultures of the world have these legends, all of them. You know, the Hopi and all of them. And, and I'm going to go down and do some more compar comparisons because really I was into this 20, 30 years ago in depth. And 
many say that, okay, this is all a setup for Project Bluebeam. You know, NASA is beta testing an alien invasion. And so, you know, we're expecting Project Bluebeam and we're going to see fake alien ships in the sky and it's all an illusion. And it's all about just trying to get us to, to worship uh, some human who will be the Antichrist and then accept some other uh, alien god or, quote unquote, you know, demonic entity that we will worship. And so, you know, that's all well and good as well. And, and that is another line of thinking. Um, but perhaps, you know, Project Bluebeam, you know, uh, without a doubt, they can make us see things that aren't there. But perhaps there are really going to be things there as well. And we have so many people afraid of the New World Order when the New World Order, honestly, has been with us the whole time. You know, unless you want to talk about just taking it to another level where it's completely out in the open and there's just absolutely no more freedom. But Pax Romana goes on and it's Pax Americana. It's, there's no difference. As we've talked about, you know, the power has gone. Uh, it's just changed. It changed back with Constantine and the Roman Catholic Church. It, it just shifted gears. And we see the same... Roman eagles flying now, you know, over the American flag. And ultimately, it's it's all the same control. So when you start looking at it, we know that there's a group that's here that realizes the reality of extraterrestrials and interdimensionals because there are both. And in reality, we know about our own existence being multi-dimensional because we are multi-dimensional beings and that part of the fact has been kind of hidden from us but we actually do operate on more than one dimension when you sleep you're in basically what's you know considered to be the astral realm and you could also get to that realm and other realms through meditation and that's a big part of why that has been looked down on in the uh, in the West because they don't want your consciousness expanding so this is a book called The Watchers, and it's very, very fascinating because, you know, we know of The Watchers from biblical stories. You know, The Watchers, we could go to Genesis 6, and then we could go into the book of Enoch and the actual book of The Watchers, which I'm going to pull out and do some PDFs uh, and let you guys get into that in greater detail. And so who are these Watchers? Well, this is Betty Andreasen. And so Raymond, Raymond Fowler wrote a book about her experiences, and she's, she's a contactee. So she is somebody that's had um, basically experiences with what you might want to call aliens or interdimensionals, because they're actually kind of both, uh, extraterrestrial, interdimensional ETs of more than one type. And uh, I do have... Um, more info on what she went through. Now what's interesting is she, she went through multiple abduction exper experiences in which not only her but others, you know, she witnessed others basically having uh, genetic experiments done on them. And you know how many people have had these experiences? Thousands documented. Um, and probably tens of thousands, perhaps even millions have had this these experiences and it's so interesting because when we look at Genesis 6 you know it basically talks about um, you know the giants being created and then the Nephilim and all that and and you know you gotta realize that what we have in the Bible are just cliff notes these are the tiny little pieces of the story just the tiny little ones that they allowed to be put in because they didn't want too much in there. And so it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them that the sons of, of God, and it's actually sons of the gods, you know, is the more correct trans, translation, saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took, the, took them wives of all that they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with man for that he is also flesh. Yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and after that, when the sons of sons of the gods 
came in unto the daughters of men, and they laid they lay bare children with to them, and they became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Okay, so they became mighty men of old, men of renown. Interesting. So that that's interesting in and of itself. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him in his heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man that I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. And then it goes into the Noah story, which comes from Utpatnisham, which is the Sumerian story, which predates it by over a thousand years, probably more like two thousand years. So, and it has much, much greater detail than you have here as well. And um, it's interesting when you when you look in um, and when you look into it in depth, and you start looking at some of the passages, you you get a bigger picture, and some of the old mythologies, you know, start to come alive again as well. In Deuteronomy 32, and of course King James Version is has been, you know, very much a version that was, you know, sanitized for the masses in, in the sense that this was Constantine putting his empire together. And so, he, or trying to keep his empire together too. So, he, he did want to eliminate anything that would give humans their own power and wanted to consolidate power into the church. And so, it's fascinating. This one always hit me. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, and this is, you know, there's much better translations, really. When he separated the sons of Adam, and this is not even, this is so off, honestly. Um, but we'll go through it. When he, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. And that's, it, it's such a mistranslation. For the Lord's portion of his own people, Jacob, the lot of his inheritance. And it goes on basically talking about, you know, finding Jacob and, uh, you know, bringing him to the, to the promised land and everything. And, you know, the Lord did lead him. There was no strange God with him, etc., etc. Now this is this is closer. So remember the days of long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father, he will inform you, inquire of your elders, and they will tell you. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of his heavenly court. Ooh, that is totally different, is it not? Yeah, well think about who Put the King James out there. It was Constantine, and why? Because he was trying to keep his his whole empire from crumbling. Because Christianity was spreading rapidly, and it was such a myriad of different beliefs, and it was catching on by like wildfire. And he couldn't. He was having a hard time controlling people. He was having a hard time basically managing his empire. It was starting to slip from him. So. If you can't beat them, join them, but create a sanitized version that gives you power over them. And that's exactly what he did. So when the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, and he established the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the heavenly court. For the people of Israel belong to the Lord. Jacob is his special portion. He found them in a desert land. In the empty howling wasteland, he surrounded them and watched over them. He guarded them as he would guard his own eyes. And so it goes on. And then, it, you know, it does talk about foreign gods, you know. So referencing the fact that there's other, you know, gods up there as well. And, you know, there's so many things that are sanitized from uh, the Bible as well in regards to that. Because originally, 
the Hebrews were very much like everybody else out there. And things have been changed and sanitized. So getting back to Betty Andreasen's situation, basically, again, this type of situation she found to be still ongoing. Experiments on humans and, and cross-breeding them with other uh, non-human species. And so, and we've seen this too in many other uh, cases of abductions. And so, you know, there are hybrid races still being created, perhaps not released on the earth yet, but maybe they will be released on the earth at some time. Also, you know, she was taken up in different ways. She was actually removed from her body. So she was kind of separated. Her astral body pulled from the physical body and brought up onto a ship. And, and so this is a case with her and her partner both being pulled upwards astrally out of the physical bodies because these beings are multidimensional as we are. Uh, but they have greater control over their ability, their consciousness, so they can basically control shifting in and out of dimensions to a much higher degree than we can. And there are some yogis that can, can do these things, some masters that can do a lot of these things. And so she encountered many different types of beings, uh, you know, the typical little gray aliens that we have seen and others that will look like... Um, the tall Nordic whites and these other almost synthetic Android beings that were kind of faceless and this is fascinating too because um, I think I might have done a video on a book called Edadorfa which is about um, a, a journey inside the earth and supposedly it really really happened it's supposed to be a true account and of one man's journey inside the earth and discovering that there's whole civilizations in there humanoid beings many different types of beings including these strange beings that have no face and seem to be almost synthetic workers um, and exactly the same beings that that she describes in this book as well and Edadorfa is Aphrodite spelled backwards and so it's, it's an old book from I think the 1890s so she is in this picture greeted by an elder which are you know seven to eight foot tall nordic looking aliens who actually the little greys work for and um very interesting because these beings could almost be taken to be angelic in some ways so it makes you think again about all those stories as well and here she is with the little greys on the one side and the nords on the other. And then this gets into her story, uh, the Andreasen Affair. And so there's excerpts from the book in here and a lot of info into it as well. And um, it's very interesting because, you know, when she pressed about why are they doing this? And they said, well, she asked them who they were and they said, we are the Watchers. Quite simply, we are the Watchers. And it's like, well, where have I heard that? Well, obviously, the Watchers, <laughs> out of the Bible and out of other texts as well. And so they are saying that they are the Watchers, the same beings uh, going way, way back. And they monitor things. And when she asked, why are they doing tests? They, they basically talked about pollution and, and everything happening on the earth and they're they're monitoring it and they did tell her about horrible things that were going to happen because of what was happening on the earth and so Betty was a devout Christian and um, you know very very uh, had very very strong beliefs as well um, so it's just interesting fascinating you know her case and seeing these different beings and I've, I've shared with you guys as well um, <clears throat> some of you know what I have encountered as well. And so this is a tall gray alien, which actually looks very more more white in skin. Um, they're very very tall, as it says here. You know, six to eight, maybe sometimes nine feet tall. Very humanoid, very pale, very white. No hair on their bodies at all. 
And so they're supposed to have originated from the Orion constellation. And they play an overseeing role, according to Dr. Arthur Horn, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the short greys. So they're over the little greys. The short greys are overseen within their own ranks by the taller, seven to eight foot tall greys. These gray ones are the ones that actually carry out diplomatic missions, such as secretly, secretly negotiating treaties with the heads of human governments. As mentioned, the greys in general, and the small three to five foot greys in particular, have been likened to mercenaries. And there's even the thought that they're not even really fully biological uh, as well. Confirmation for the diplomatic role played by the tall greys comes from William Cooper, who unfortunately is dead. Um, basically, he was visited for tax evasion, quote unquote, um, and was basically killed in his doorway uh, by government officials. But he did write a great book called Behold a Pale Horse, and he talked all about the government involvement with ETs and how real it is that there really are ETs here, interdimensionals here. And uh, pretty much the scenario that he laid out in that book is exactly what we see happening now. Exactly. And so he did talk about the tall greys negotiating agreements with the Eisenhower administration in the meetings beginning in 1954. Later in 54, a race of large nose gray aliens which had been orbiting the Earth landed at Helleman Air Force Base. Basic agreement was reached. The race identified themselves as oper originating from a planet around the red star in the constellation of Orion, which we call Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse, remember that? Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse. They stated that their planet was dying and that at some unknown future time they would no longer be able to survive there. Although most likely this is a lie, tall greys probably want to change their genes with the help of human genes to create their new species capable of living on planet Earth. So some, some think this is all about um, hybridization and making it so that they can inhabit this planet because think in terms of, again, the, the body is a 3D vessel that enables us to operate in this world and DNA extends out into the energy bodies as well as just with the physical body. And so we have seen on this planet evidence of so many different types of humanoid beings that have gone you know and become extinct so australopithecus ramapithecus gigantopithecus which is fascinating looks just like bigfoot and i made a video on that a long time ago um, as well as many many others obviously and so where is all this experimenting coming from and where are what's what's causing all these civilizations that we see on the the planet to rise and fall and be just totally wiped out well perhaps these are the answers right here and so these are ebens and now going back to this uh, i've shared with you guys before in in, in different videos and uh, yeah this puts me out there as being kind of woo woo probably but you know, I've, I've had a lot of experiences my entire life uh, with different things. And I shared with you guys, I was part of a paranormal research group for, for two years uh, and did a lot of investigations as well. But I mean, all that stems from the fact that, you know, in my life, I've always had unusual uh, encounters. And, um, you know, it could be partly the fact that um, be negative and, um, RH negative blood, it does seem like most of the people that are tracked um, are people that have RH negative blood. And if you look at the uh, cases of abduction, the vast majority of the time it's people with RH negative blood. And so RH negative blood, the thought is it doesn't come from here. <laughs> and so they're keeping eye on, on this. And um, basically going back to last December, um, I had a very weird thing where I had locked all the doors and you know every every door in the house was locked and for some reason I woke up it was a little bit after midnight and I went and stood out in the living room where there was a door that actually went out to the backyard and it was wide open the door was wide open and my dogs wouldn't come out Zeke wouldn't come out and uh, at that time I was with my ex and so she has a dog too 
and neither dog would come out with me to go check it out. They just stayed in there. They didn't want to come out of the room. And so I checked it out, looked all around, there was nothing there. But I did have a really weird feeling. And if you ever had that feeling before, and maybe you just, you know, you, you go into a spot and something just feels weird and you're just standing there and you're zoning out and you don't even know how long you're just standing there. Well, that's kind of what how it was. And so, you know, I locked the door, went back to sleep. And then, a, like, a couple nights later, I was in deep sleep and I felt something kind of enter my lower abdomen right where my lower dantian is. And the lower dantian is your lower energy center it's it's where you store your physical chi your life force that is stored in the body itself and so i felt something go into my lower dantian and it was bizarre um it did feel kind of warm and i don't know what it was but it woke me up and so when i opened my eyes this is what i saw yeah standing over me and it was hunched over and it stood up immediately because it was obviously doing something with my lower dantian and um, I'm not sure what it was doing but it stood up and it was surprised that I could see it and so it kind of shifted its head looking away from me and kind of went into a meditative state where it started to get to be less physical and started to actually just kind of fade from my vision slowly but I did have time to blink my eyes several times and just watch it. And it didn't scare me, even though it was hunched over and it was a cathedral ceiling. I would say the ceiling was about nine feet tall and it was hunched over so it wasn't hitting its head. Um, and it just basically slowly faded away. I think I got to watch it for several minutes as it faded totally out of sight. And then I just basically went back to sleep. Um, because I've had these experiences before. And then when I woke up in the morning, I uh, was getting coffee, my ex told me, you know there was a little spot of blood on your pillow, um, just a little dot, you know, a tiny little pinprick of blood on the back of your pillow. And I thought that was really curious. Um, and then I told her about, um, you know, what had happened. And so it isn't the first time that I've experienced that. When I was about seven, I saw a little guy like this, and he came to me on successive nights, and then I ended up basically sleeping in my parents' bedroom for a month. <laughs> I wouldn't go back into my room after that. And so these are Ebens, and so they're also known as large-nosed greys. They, they are the ones that come from Betelgeuse, um, supposedly. So, you know, the tall greys, made an agreement supposedly with the government that allowed them to abduct humans in exchange for technology and so they want to do their they're doing what they're doing they're taking our genetic seed and perhaps creating hybrids that you know will be bodies suitable for them to inhabit and utilize in this third dimensional reality and the other thing that is curious is both of my kids have have had experiences with um, typical gray aliens throughout their lives as well so it does seem to travel through bloodlines and my father was very very quiet man that never really spoke about much and he was he was brought up catholic and he went all through all of his schooling was in catholic school and um the one thing that he did totally believe in and had no doubts about was the existence of ETs, and he would never go into de depth with it. He all he told me is he knows and he's he's seen. So that was it. He just he would never go into any more detail, but he just knew. So that's what I tend to think it comes from. So this article, out of curiously enough, Forbes, Iran says tall white space aliens control America. And documents leaked by NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden conclusively prove the U.S. has been ruled by a race of tall white space aliens who also assisted the rise of Nazi Germany in the 30s. These revelations about our alien overlords might not cost you any sleep, but the part that should concern you a tad is that the UFO story was just published by the FARS news agency. The English language, and this is back in 2014, 
uh, the English language news service of Iran, a nation that might be very close to acquiring nuclear weapons. So this being a crazy conspiracy theory, naturally the Russians are behind it. Ha ha. And so the alleged alien invasion was revealed in an alleged report by Russia's FSB spy agency, which found incontrovertible proof that the alien extraterrestrial intelligence agenda is driving U.S. domestic and international policy, and has been doing so since at least 1945. And over here, Ike and the Alien Ambassadors, and this is out of the Washington Post. Fifty years ago tomorrow, on February 20th, 1954. Well, that's back in the back in the day. President Dwight Eisenhower interrupted his vacation in Palm Springs, California, to make a secret nocturnal trip to a nearby Air Force base to meet two extraterrestrial aliens, or maybe not. Maybe Ike just went to his dentist. There was some dispute about this. The Ike met with ET theory is advanced by Michael Sala, a former American University professor who now runs the Peace Ambassador Program at AU Center for Global Peace. The Ike went to the dentist theory as advanced by the folks at Dwight D. Eisenhower Libra Library in Abilene, Kansas, and by James M. Dixit Mixon, a dentist, professor of dentistry, and historian of presidential dental work. So just to make things more intriguing on the night in question, the Associated Press reported this. President Eisenhower died tonight of a heart attack in Palm Springs. Two minutes later, the AP retracted that bulletin and reported that Ike was still alive. Indeed, he was alive and continued living until 69. But in the decades since his death, his activities on that night of February 20, 1954, have been become fodder for strange theories about alien beings. So, and it gets into more. But basically, when we think about it, and we read from all sources. Take in all sources. Don't just believe in one source, you know, and, and don't believe anything. Just you have to weigh it for yourself. But when you study comparative mythology, when you study all these different legends, and there's so much that we could pull from, and then if you have first-hand experiences as well, it, it becomes a clearer picture. So I just wanted to share all this with you guys, and there's so much more that we could go into in depth here. And we will. There's there's so much more to be uncovered in this. And uh, it's part of a bigger picture. But, you know, our world is getting bigger. And we're recognizing that, you know, there is a lot more going on here than meets the eye. And obviously, we've, we've talked about it feeling lately like we are in the Truman Show. And that things are just crazy. But when you recognize that, you know, there probably has been an ET presence here millions of years because there are there are many sources that say that the Greys have been here for millions of years. And <clears throat> there's there's so much for us to go into in this and, and I'm just skimming the surface with this. And we could tie it into the Bible, we'll, we could tie it into uh, the Book of Enoch and the Book of the Watchers and you know, get, start to get into uh, many of the other traditions, look into Mithraism and look into, you know, many other traditions and philosophies that are out there. And, of course, we have the jinn of your Islamic faith as well. And, you know, there's a lot more going on here than, than meets the eye. And we need to really put all the puzzle pieces together. So, my friends, as always, please do thumbs up, support the channel, make sure you subscribe, click the bell to get all the notifications. We live in a much wilder world than we can ever imagine, and uh, it, it's it's actually, you know, you can view it as pretty damn exciting as well. And may you guys still always be blessed with abundant peace, love, happiness, wellness, and may you always be kept safe in these times. God bless and namaste, my friends.